So this is, uh, can we go on with uh, algebraic geometry? We were, <coughs> last time we had uh, talked about irreducible components and uh, say the ideal of an algebraic set and finally we had started to talk about Hilbert's Nullstellensatz, so the theorem of zeros. Um, Nullstellensatz. <coughs> so which is, uh, which tells us something about the relation between an algebraic set and the corresponding ideal. So <coughs> first we have the, the weak version, which uh, I stated the other time. So, so weak uh, Nullstellensatz. Um, anyway, so as I said, Nullstellensatz means theorem of zeros. But for some reason, it's always referred to by its German name. Um, so this says that if, if I is, a, is an idea in the polynomial ring, which is a strict ideal, so a proper ideal. So an ideal which is not equal to the whole of the polynomial ring, then its zero set is non-empty. Okay, as I said, I will not prove this now. If you are interested, I will prove it later in the chapter on dimension, when it follows from the things that we do anyway. Um, I will instead use it to prove the strong form of the Nullstellensatz and make some conclusions. Um, so the way we usually want to use uh, this theorem is in this uh, kind of trivial reformulation, which is the following remark. So usually, we will use this as follows, is used in the following form. So if uh, I is an ideal uh, such that its zero set is empty, then it follows that one is contained in I. That's usually uh, how one uh, will use it. So sometimes you uh, want to show that something is a polynomial and then this ideal will somehow be the possible denominators and then one of the denominators will be one and so it's a polynomial or things like that. Anyway, this is how one usually uses it. And obviously this is equivalent. No? Because if an idea contains one, it's equal to the whole of kx1 to xn, and uh, then it's just a contraposition of the original statement. Um, and one should also remark, um, we have assumed in the whole course that uh, our ground field k is algebraically closed. Otherwise, uh, this uh, theorem is wrong. Um, you know, for instance, the, the most trivial example is if you take the ideal x squared plus one in kx, in rx, over the real numbers, then it's zero set if I call this i, the zero set of i will be uh, the set of all uh, points a in k in r such that a squared is equal to minus one. And so this is the empty set. All 
Okay. And obviously this is not the whole of uh, Rx. This idea doesn't contain the constants. So uh, now, um, now we want to, so this is kind of the weak form and the question <coughs> is what's the precise relation uh, between an ideal and its zero set. We had seen, so we know that um, if, um, um, say, J is an ideal, then we have that uh, the zero set of J is some, some affine algebraic set. And if we take its ideal, then this will contain J. Because just by definition, uh, this ideal consists of all polynomials which vanish uh, on the set, and uh, these are among these polynomials. And uh, conversely, if X in, uh, is a subset, uh, is an affine algebraic set, so in the N, affine algebraic set, then we have that uh, we can look at the zero set of the idea of X, and we had seen that this is actually equal to X that we had seen. It's also easy. So, I mean, the obvious question is whether this is also true here, which means that we would have a bijection between ideals and zero sets. So is for all ideals And um, so that, which me would mean that we have a bijection between ideals in Kx1 to Xn and, and define algebraic sets. And the answer is no. And it's actually easy to see that this will not be the case because, <clears throat> you know, it comes from the fact that if you have a polynomial and the power of this, of this polynomial, they have the same zero set. So, for instance, for instance, we can just look in, in A, A1. We have that if we look at the zero set of the ideal generated by, say, x squared, I mean, this is obviously equal just the point zero. But um, uh, I mean, the idea of zero, so all the polynomials, uh, that vanish in one variable that vanish at zero are precisely the polynomials with, with zero constant term. So this is the idea generated by X. Okay, and so they are different. Um, but the, the statement of the Nullstellensatz of the theorem of zeros is that in a suitable sense, this is precisely all that can go wrong. So that it is the difference between uh, the, an ideal and the ideal of the zero set of the ideal is by being allowed to take powers of the elements. And so this we want to formalize by introducing this. So definition. So, <coughs> so let I be an ideal in a ring R so then I introduce the radical um, and one can either write it like this or I often will write it like square root but it's obviously not the square root it's just radical <coughs> 
of i is um, uh, of i is this which is the set of all elements in the ring such that some power of the element lies in i. So there exists an n bigger than 0 such that r to the n is an element in i. Okay. Um, it's an easy, maybe I don't do it, so exercise um, this radical of i is an idea. You know, if you just straightforwardly go through the definitions, we'll find that this uh, satisfies the definition of an idea. <coughs> And uh, so, so we call, uh, so I is called uh, a radical ideal uh, if, uh, well, one can say it in two words, so if it's equal to its own radical, and uh, you can easily see that this is equivalent to the fact that I is equal to the radical of some ideal. And this comes from the fact that from the definition it easily follows that if you take the radical of the radical, this is equal to the radical. So and now we see directly that this has something to do with, uh, with this story here because uh, uh, we see that if uh, x is an affine algebraic set, then its ideal is radical ideal. I mean, to be a radical ideal, the reformulation is that if any power of an element lies in the ideal, then the element itself lies there. So let's see. I mean, that's again trivial, but at least it's so. So let we take an element, a polynomial such that if some power of it lies in the ideal of X. Well, <coughs> so in other words, we have that f vanishes on the whole of x. So, <coughs> so then for all points p and x, we have that f to the n of p is equal to 0. But this is just the same as f of p to the power n. No? And if a power, so we have this is some number, its nth power is 0, so the number is 0. So as it follows, f of p is equal to 0. So we see that, uh, and thus this means precisely that f lies in the ideal of x. So trivially, by the definition, the ideal of an affine algebraic set is uh, a radical ideal. And now we come to the formulation of um, the strong form of the Nullstellensatz, which, as I said, is uh, says theorem. Which says that, um, so, let I be an ideal in K x1 to xn, uh, then um, if I take 
the ideal of the zero set of i, this is equal to the radical of i. Um, so maybe you mind uh, this notation that the i is, he has here two different meanings. So this i is just an ideal, and this is this process of taking the ideal of a zero set. I uh, excuse myself, but the point is I, I would like to use the j in the proof, so I don't want to call it j. But anyway, I think you can distinguish what these two i's mean something different. Okay. So this is a, a not so easy theorem. I mean, actually, the, the first part, the weak Wurstein satz is more difficult. This is, a, in some sense, a, a consequence of the weak one. So we will prove this as a consequence of the weak Wurstein satz, but even the, this proof is not so straightforward. So how does it go? <coughs> ah, so before doing this, I. So in the proof, I will talk about the, the fraction field or the quotient field of an integral domain. So I briefly will introduce it because I talk about uh, uh, field, the field of rational functions in several variables. I mean, it's something you, I think, already had in the algebra course, but uh, you know, I just briefly recall uh, what you are supposed to know. So this is... Uh, the quotient field of an integral domain. So R should be an integral domain. So the quotient field Q of R is a set of uh, some equivalence classes of pairs. So is the set of uh, equivalence classes and well of pairs uh, F G, where F and G are in R and G is different from zero. Under the equivalence relation that FG is uh, equivalent to F prime G prime, well, if, uh, if and only if uh, FG prime is equal to F prime G in R. Um, so these equivalence classes I write, so equivalence class of uh, Fg is denoted F divided by G, which also comes somehow explains uh, <coughs> the, you know, this thing, because if you really, if, you are, if the ring, for instance, would happen to be the integers, then these Equivalence classes correspond precisely to the rational numbers. And you can do this, however, for any integral domain. And you have, again, multiplication, addition, and multiplication are defined by the usual formulas for fractions, you know, as if you were in elementary school. So F divided by G plus F prime divided by g prime is f g prime plus g f prime, if you want, divided by g g prime. And um, f divided by g times f prime divided by g prime is equal to f f prime divided by g g prime. So again, like you learn in elementary school except that now we are in a general ring and not dealing with integers. But the whole point of this is that this is all that happens. You can compute this if you had them. <coughs> and then you can view R as a subring of QR. So first, easy to see. 
uh, that this thing q of r is a field. Um, and uh, we have that r. So identifying an element r in r with uh, the kind of fraction r divided by 1 in q of r. So the map which sends such a thing to this is, is easy seen to be injective. And you can just identify it if you want. Then uh, we get that r is a subring of q of r. OK. <clears throat> so this is uh, all very uh, standard. I mean, obviously, the inverse of, uh, of f divided by g is g divided by f, as in high school, as in again in elementary school, and so on. OK. So in particular, we will only look at a very special case, namely that our ring is a polynomial ring in several variables. So, so in particular, so the quotient field of the polynomial ring kx1 to xn is denoted um, uh, usually at uh, like this with round brackets um, is called um, a field of rational functions in these variables. And you know, you can see that these are just, so the elements are just, you know, of the form f divided by g um, with f and g polynomials. And you compute with them in the obvious way. You, know, you just multiply them and uh, add them and divide them really as fractions. And this will be a field. OK. So now, uh, after this uh, thing, we can, you know, I will use this very briefly in a moment. Now we want to uh, actually come to the proof of this Nullstellensatz, and we will use this, uh, this thing. So, So we start with our idea. So we know that it's finitely generated. So we can as well write that. So we, so, so proof write um, i equal to f1 to fr for some polynomials fi, some polynomials in i. <coughs> Okay. Now, I mean, we know, we have seen that if we take the idea of the zero set of i, this is a radical idea. And we also know it contains i. So it follows that the idea of the zero set of i contains the radical of i. So we are supposed to prove the other conclusion. Well, and uh, so basically now we just take an element here and we have to show it lies here. So let f be an element in the idea of the zero set of i. And we have to show there exists an n bigger than 0 such that f to the n lies in i. So from the fact that it vanishes here, we have to prove that. And that's actually. You know, if you think of it, 
that doesn't look so easy because, you know, for instance, it's not at all clear where you should get this n from. You know? And so there must be some kind of trick. And, <coughs> the, and we somehow <coughs> uh, maybe also want to use the, the weak null Sternsatz, but it doesn't look very clear how one could do it. But the trick consists in uh, using the weak null Sternsatz in one variable more. So use weak null Sternsatz. in k x1 xn comma t. It's not quite clear what this will do for us, but at least let's do that. <coughs> and so for this, we will have to produce an, an I, using i, we, are, we will have to produce an ideal here whose zero set is empty. So let's write it down, J. So let J be now the ideal generated by these self-same polynomials. And one more, we have here this F. So we take F times T minus one. So this is the ideal uh, in K X one xn comma t. So we first have the idea generated in this bigger ring by these polynomials which only depend on the first few and then we add one more polynomial which also depends on t. And so we take this idea and we ask ourselves what is the zero set of j? Okay. So let's look at it. So we take a point, uh, so let say P comma A be a point in A n plus one. So where P is a point in A n and A is a point in K. So then you know this is a, an n plus one tuple. And we ask ourselves, what does it mean? So we want to know whether it can be that PA is an element in the zero set of J. Well, when will this happen? So all of these polynomials must vanish. So this one, these ones depend only on the first few coordinates. So they only give coordinates for P. So the first coordinate, the first statement is that F1 of P until FR of P should be zero. But uh, we know that, <coughs> that, so, that uh, the zero set of them is, well, anyway. So we have that uh, F1 of P is equal to FR of P equal to zero, which in this, this itself is equivalent to the fact that P is an element in the zero set of I. No, because uh, <coughs> And the second statement is that, uh, well, f of p <coughs> times a should be equal to one. But you know, f lies in the ideal of the zero set of i. That is, if this, if p lies in the zero set of i, then f of p is equal to zero. And so this cannot be true. So I mean. You know, this implies that f of p is equal to zero, and therefore this is impossible. So these two conditions can never be fulfilled at the same time, and so we deduce that indeed z of j is equal to the empty set. Um, <clears throat> so, and now uh, I told you that we have this way how we usually use the weak null Sternsatz. So this follows, this implies that J contains the element one. So by the weak null Sternsatz, uh, 
we have that 1 is an element of j. Well, and we can write out what this means. No, just it's a linear, co linear combination with coefficients in kx1 plus nt of these elements. So that means we have thus we can write 1 is equal to say g0 times ft minus 1 plus some i equals 1 to r gi fi and this identity so where the g0 to gr are the polynomials in x1 to xn and t and this identity holds in uh, kx1 to xn comma t. So we have this identity. Okay. Now, the obvious question that one can ask oneself here is why should this be helpful to us? We are interested in finding out something about i. Now, we have made a different ideal in one more variable. Um, and we find, uh, okay, that that contains 1. So we have to have a way to get back to kx1 to xn. Okay. And how do we do this? We, you know, replace t by a polynomial in, well, we express t in terms of something in x1 to xn. In fact, we replace t by 1 over f. But, for, but this only makes sense in the uh, fraction field. So, so we define, so now we want to go back to k x1 to xn. But uh, this is via the fraction field, k x1 to xn. So we um, define homomorphism. To define a ring homomorphism. Say phi from uh, this ring to the fraction field or the, the quotient field or the field of rational functions in x1 to xn, which is done by taking any polynomial and sending it to this polynomial where we let the first few variables uh, in, in the first two variables, we just take the same. And for the last one, we put 1 over f. Now, this is <coughs> uh, clearly a homomorphism, because if you take the sum of two polynomials, you okay, get here the sum of the rational functions. I mean, it's clear what this notation needs, no? I, I hope. Um, and if you take the product and so on, it will always be like this. Um, but, you know, if the polynomial here contains some t, you will get some power of f in the denominator. So you don't end up in the polynomial ring, but in this uh, fraction field. Okay, you have this homomorphism. <coughs> so, and now, you know, you take this identity and want to see what happens to the identity by applying this homomorphism. Okay, so applying phi, so this... Uh, maybe a star or something. So apply uh, phi on both sides to the identity star. We get one. Well, let's see. Before we do it, we maybe have to look at it a little bit. So what happens to ft minus 1? So f is a polynomial in x1 to xn, so nothing changes. T is sent to 1 over f, so we have f divided by f, which is 1, minus 1. So this becomes 0. So this term is just not there. Then the fi, again, depend only on x1 to xn, so they do not get changed. Okay. So what we find is uh, that uh, we get... Um, 1 is equal to sum i equals 1 to r. Um, 
So phi of gi times fi. And this is an identity in this field of rational functions. Okay. Now, <clears throat> now we have to, we want to, you know, get rid of the denominator so that we get a statement in kx1 to xn. So we have to ask ourselves what are the denominators. So if you look at this, what if we have, what have we done? So we, we have taken this polynomial, we have replaced t by 1 over f. So the only denominators that we can have are powers of f. Namely, whenever we have some power of t, we get the same power of 1 over f. Okay? So these fi are anyway just, you know, polynomials in x1 to xn, but it applies to this. So we have that uh, there exist some numbers ni uh, in uh, so non-negative integers such that phi of gi can be written as gi divided by f to the ni to the power ni where gi is a polynomial in k x1 to xn. No? <clears throat> and so now if we have that, we can clear the denominators. We can uh, multiply with the, uh, whatever, the maximum of the f, f to the maximum of the ni's, then there will be no denominators here. And here we get the power of f, which actually will turn out to prove the theorem. So let n be the maximum of the ni, so from i equals 1 to r. So then, so we multiply by, by f to the n, then we get, get the identity uh, f to the n is equal to, uh, what is it, gi, so sum i equals 1 to r, uh, gi times f to the power n minus ni, which is some non-negative number, um, times fi. But now what do we see? So this is a linear combination of the fi's. So, you know, the fi generate the ideal i, large i. So it means that this thing is an element of i. And we have proven what we wanted to prove. We have found some power of f which lies in i. But it comes about in this very roundabout way as the maximal denominator we need in this expression. So the, the fact that before we couldn't uh, uh, have a guess for what power of n one should need to take is reflected in the complicatedness in the proof, in the proof because the proof goes in such a way that there's no, no way how you can find out. Okay. <clears throat> so um, anyway, so this proves uh, this theorem. And you can see it's, uh, it's not, it's a bit tricky. <clears throat> now, um, moment we will not really have very many applications of it. So we now find that we have indeed this bijection between, uh, say, the fine algebraic sets in an and the radical ideals in k x1 to xn. So we have a bijection in both directions. So in the one direction, one goes with the ideal, the other one with the zero set. And these are uh, two bijections in both directions, which are inverse to each other. So we have a precise, uh, so precise correspondence between radical ideals and affine algebraic sets. <clears throat> okay, 
So I want to give some small corollary. Um, I had, um, we had proven as a statement that uh, an, um, and a fine algebraic set is irreducible if and only if its uh, ideal is a prime ideal. That sounds like a nice statement, but in practice it uh, wouldn't be so nice because it's very difficult, it's not so easy to find out what the ideal of an affine algebraic set is. Usually you are given the affine algebraic set as a zero set of some, some polynomials. And so it's not so um, obvious. But uh, in this case, as a corollary, you can get a more direct statement. So the first is, so if, say, i in k x1 to xn is a prime ideal, then its zero set is irreducible. And the second statement, which is in some sense the corollary, is that if f in k x1 to xn is an irreducible polynomial, so it cannot be written as a product of two polynomials unless one of them is constant, uh, then uh, its zero set is also irreducible. Okay, so the other statement was that, that we had before is that if um, uh, the ideal of the zero set is a prime ideal, then it's irreducible. So that's not a power of quite the same thing, but it actually is almost trivially so because uh, from the definition, it follows that prime ideals are radical. Because <clears throat> what does it say? You know, to be a prime ideal means that if you have uh, f and g in the ring such that f times g lies in the ideal, then it follows f lies in the ideal or g lies in the ideal. And now if you have instead a power of an element, so you have an element in, in the ring, so that's, that the power lies in the ideal, then it should follow that already the element lies there this is a special case where, you know, these f and g can be taken as one f and the other one some power of f, okay? And then you can make induction. <coughs> okay, so, so thus, if uh, i is a prime ideal, then, uh, it is a radical ideal, so if I take the ideal of the zero set of i, this is just i. And so uh, the statement, and you know, and this is still a prime ideal, and therefore it's irreducible. And we know, uh, so, and uh, if that is the prime ideal, So, so if I write, uh, so, if, so, so that, so if I write x equal to z of i, we have that i of x is prime, so thus x is irreducible by what we had seen before. And the, uh, the second part is a special case if one uh, so um, for two uh, if uh, f is irreducible so um, it is a fact which uh, was maybe mentioned or maybe also proven but I don't know in the algebra course 
that k x1 to xn is a unique factorization domain. I will not recall what that means, but one of the things that follow is that every irreducible element is a prime element. So that means if f in k x1 to xn is irreducible, then it follows that the ideal generated by f is a prime ideal. So this is something which holds uh, in unique factorization domains. Well, and so, and so thus, if this is irreducible, then this is a prime ideal, and thus uh, the, the zero set of f, which is the same as the zero set of the ideal generated by f, is irreducible. So that was um, for the moment. So this is the, as much as I want to say about the Nullstein satz for the moment. So now <coughs> I want to come to a different topic, which is projective varieties and projective algebraic sets. So, um, you know, we here do everything over some algebraically closed field, but for the intuition, it's in some sense best to think uh, about the complex numbers. And so if you, for instance, take some a fine algebraic set, which is, does not happen just to be a finite set of points, but it has some, is somehow bigger, <coughs> over the complex numbers, you will find that it always somehow goes to infinity, so it will always be non-compact. Okay. And um, <clears throat> this somehow, I mean, somehow it's nice to also look at compact things. I mean, it's, they, have a, they behave nicer in many ways and are in some sense the more interesting and more useful uh, things to study. I mean, also from the viewpoint of topology or whatever. Anyway, so therefore, we want to somehow you know, do something like compactifying these affine varieties. So we want to look at varieties which uh, uh, have some kind of, which at least if we would look at over the complex numbers with the standard topology would be compact. Now, um, and so this is done by adding some points at infinity. So affine varieties always, you know, they are not bounded somehow, but uh, you, you somehow add something at infinity to get some projective varieties. And this will have uh, many nice properties. I mean, one of, <coughs> so the simplest projective variety or whatever would be projective space or something. And there you can, you have this thing that if you are in the usual space, if you have two lines, then, uh, you know, usually they will intersect, but uh, sometimes they are parallel and they don't. But in um, projective space, they, what you call lines there, they will always intersect. If they, you know, if they don't intersect, if they're parallel, they intersect at infinity. And uh, so somehow looking at projective against, is there, instead of affine varieties, will also kind of remove very many case distinctions and things like that. They are just kind of uh, nice in many ways. So uh, anyway, after, Regardless of that, I mean, um, <clears throat> uh, so, you know, in some sense, uh, it turns out that projective varieties are more important to study than affine varieties. And affine varieties are, you know, you would more think of them by thinking at, you know, how locally a projective variety looks like. So to look at a piece of it. 
but the, 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 the total thing you want to study would be rather a projective variety. And so we want to uh, now introduce them. So I first tell you what the projective space is, and then projective varieties will be uh, zero sets of polynomials in projective space, where we even have to worry what we mean by that. So first, projective space. and projective algebraic sets. So, uh, so on, so this is a definition. On uh, Kn, so Kn plus one, without the origin, so the origin in Kn plus one. Uh, I have an equivalence relation um, so whatever. So I say that an N plus one tuple A zero to A N is equivalent to B zero to Bn, if and only if they differ by multiplying all of them by the same non-zero constant. So if and only if there exists a lambda in k without zero, such that uh, a zero to a n is equal to lambda b zero until lambda Bn. So just the whole vector is obtained by multiplying by the same constant. And I, um, so the quotient, so maybe write first E0 for n for the equivalence class with a square bracket. And um, the, the quotient I call projective space. So n-dimensional projective, so projective n space or n-dimensional projective space um, is the quotient, quotient set. divided by this equivalence relation. Okay. So an element in projective space is just uh, an n plus one tuple of uh, elements in K or a, a vector in Kn plus one up to multiplying by non-zero Kens constant. So which is equivalent to saying it is a line so in a one-dimensional subspace, subvector space of Kn plus one, you know, because such a line is determined by uh, a non-zero vector on the line, you know, up to multiplication by a non-zero constant. So you can also view projective space of this as a space of lines in Kn plus one. But I mean, lines means linear subspace, so lines to the origin. So now we want to somehow show that this is somehow has some relation also with a fine space. So we want to somehow find uh, that there are n plus one subsets which look a little bit like our a n. And we will use one of them to identify a n as a subset uh, of this. So, <clears throat> definition. Well, definition is a bit strong. But, and so let so we take u i so for i is an element from zero to n. Um, well, uh, we define this to be 
uh, the set of all E0 to En in Tn. Yeah. We denote this as Pn. Okay. Project the space node Pn in Pn such that, uh, well, Ai is non zero. Okay. And now I define uh, a bijection of this to uh, a n. So I take phi i from u i to a n, <coughs> which sends uh, a point a zero to a n to uh, <coughs> a point here in a n. So I take a zero divided by a i. And then it was good go, go on a one divided by a and so on. At some point, I arrive at a i divided by a i, and this I leave out. No, I want only n coordinates, and uh, then it goes on until a n divided by a i. So this will be uh, you know, something in a n, and I, I am allowed to make this quotient because I have assumed that a i is non-zero. So this is certainly. Uh, a well-defined map, and I claim it's a bijection. Because I can write down the inverse so say ui from an to ui, which sends um, Mm. Well, I write like this. I, I take. I want to write, have write, to write down an n tuple here. I do this by writing an n plus one tuple, for, of which I leave one out. So I take say b zero, and b i is not there until b n. We send this to b to b zero, and in the ith position, I put one. I mean, the ith position is not here, but you know, just where and uh, the end. And you can check that these two maps are well defined and inverse to each other. I mean, I don't know whether you, you might have already seen something like this in differential geometry or something. If you define many folds, you can find the projective space as a manifold by giving it local charts to it. and. Uh, this would somehow be such a local, would be such a set of local charts. <coughs> anyway, we have this. It's an easy, it's very easy to check that this is a bijection with this property. So, so usually we fix, uh, we concentrate on the, just on the case i equal to zero. And, um, and we want to so we want to view a n as a subset of p n by identifying uh, the point um, say. Uh, A1 to An in An with its image after, after under this, so with a point 1, A1, An in Pn. So, I mean, later we will actually do this. I mean, obviously they are not precisely the same thing, but in some sense you can see that precisely the same con information is. Uh, contained. You know, it's just a notation issue whether you write this or whether you add the one in the beginning and uh, put the brackets around it. It is, uh, <coughs> contains the same information. So, but I mean, strictly speaking, uh, the statement would be <coughs> uh, so, okay, 
No, I don't say that. Um, but given this, so with this identification, we have uh, Pn is equal to the union of An and H infinity, where uh, H infinity So with uh, H infinity defined to be, well, whatever in Pn does not lie in the image of this U0. Namely, this would be the set of all A0. Well, whatever I can write like this, A0 to N in Pn such that a0 is equal to 0. This will be called the hyperplane at infinity. So when I write this notation, strictly speaking, what it really means is this, that Pn is equal to U0 of An union H infinity. No? But I kind of use this u0 you know, as it's a bijection, and it even, I mean, not so much happens. I kind of can pretend that uh, this is the really just that I identify the image with uh, what I started with. OK. So, and, so anyway, but if we have this picture, we can really see that Pn is obtained from a n by adding something, namely this. So it is, it is a, you know, a n plus something added at infinity. Is this p n minus one? What? Well, uh, yeah, in some, that is, uh, well, it is somehow, in some sense, it is p n minus one. I mean, we don't yet know what it means to be isomorphic, but it is in some sense, uh, uh, it will be isomorphic to Pn minus 1. It's very close to Pn minus 1 because it's just, you know, if you, if you have 0 and then A1 to An, so that, lo and, you know, and A1 to An is a point in Pn minus 1. So in some sense, this will be, uh, this is essentially Pn minus 1. Okay, so yeah, you could see it is. Okay, now that we have the projective space, we want to talk about uh, projective algebraic sets. So we want to define projective algebraic sets as zero sets of polynomials in this projective space. And we <coughs> um, immediately run into some small problem that it doesn't completely make sense. So we want to define projective algebraic sets as zero sets of polynomials. So of sets of polynomials in, so, so if we are projective algebraic sets in Pn, this will be of polynomials in K x0 to xn. Um, and now there is a problem, namely, it is not true that the polynomial in K x0 to xn defines a function on Pn. So, but f in k x0 to xn does not define a function on the n. 
you know, if we have, you know, obviously it's just not true, it actually will never be true that, I mean, unless f is constant or something, that f of a0 to a n is, equal, is always different from f lambda a0 lambda a n. No? So we, we don't have that this is a function. So it's not really clear how we could talk about, so we cannot say what f of p is for, for a point p in a n. In, in Pn, because it depends on the representative. But it still sometimes makes sense about a zero of a function, namely if it's zero for all representatives. And uh, this, is, this makes sense if f is homogeneous. can still say whether p in pn is a zero of f or not. And so why is that? <coughs> well, this is the, you know, so I, I hope you remember what it means for a polynomial to be homogeneous. So you have that it's a linear combination of monomials, so some product of the xi's with some powers. Um, and it's homogeneous if the degree of all, homo of all monomials is the same. And uh, that would then be called the degree of the, this polynomial. <coughs> so, So this is the following remark. If uh, F is homogeneous, is homogeneous of degree D, uh, then we have what? If we take F of lambda a0 until lambda a n, then this will be equal to lambda to the d times f of a0 a n. And this is actually kind of obvious because if you take any monomial of this polynomial, it has degree d, so it's the product of d of these xi counted with, with their power. So if you put it into, you get uh, d of these lambda ai's. So out of each factor, you get, if, uh, out of each of these, uh, you get one factor lambda. So you get lambda to the d comes out of every, every monomial. Okay, so we have that. So in particular, so, <coughs> thus, thus, whether f of a0 to a n is equal to 0 depends only on the class of a0 to a n, so on the point in projective space. No, because lambda is a non-zero, you know, if you multiply by a non-zero constant, then the question whether or not it is zero is not changed. So then we, so with this we can define what uh, we mean by a point in projective space to be a zero uh, of a homogeneous polynomial. It is a, a zero if uh, for any representative, or equivalently for all representatives, it is a zero. So, so let uh, so G be a homogeneous polynomial. So, a point P equal to a zero 
to be n is, is 0 of g. And we will write this just, we will just write this as g of p is equal to 0. Although, I mean, in general, g of p doesn't make sense. But the question whether g of p is 0 makes sense. Um, if, well, g of a0 to a n is equal to 0 for 1 and equivalently all representatives of uh, this point. So if we have, we can, P is the equivalence class of uh, some n plus 1 tuple. And, the, and we just take you know, any representative and put it into the polynomial. If we get 0, we say it's this. And it doesn't depend on which representative we take because of uh, this statement. Now we can talk uh, about zero sets of sets of polynomials. So let S in uh, K x 0 x n be a set of polynomials, set of homogeneous polynomials So then the zero set of S is defined to be, so z of s, um, the set of all points p in pn, such that f of p is equal to 0 for all f in s, as before in the affine case, with this uh, definition of what f of p being equal to 0 means. Um, so a subset of uh, Pn of the form C of S will be is called an a projective algebraic -like set. So now we have defined what projective algebraic set is. So we only had this tiny difficulty with saying what the zero of a polynomial is. But uh, for homogeneous polynomials, that's OK. And now uh, we want to uh, also, I mean, we want to basically repeat what we did for the fine algebraic sets. So, <clears throat> so for instance, we want to show that, that every projective algebraic set is a zero set of an ideal. But one has to be a little bit more careful because we, you know, we have, you know, somehow have been forced to talk only about homogeneous polynomials. So somehow that will also uh, play a role here. And so we um, we will have to deal with so-called homogeneous ideals. Before that, maybe I can give a couple of trivial examples which anyway we will use. So for instance, so for instance, we have that the, the, <coughs> the empty set is the zero set of 1. And Pn is, uh, say, the zero set of the empty set of polynomials. So we again have uh, the most trivial uh, sets. Then we also can, the points are also fine algebraic sets. So if p equal to a0 to a n is a point in pn, then we have that, uh, well, p can be written as the zero set of um, um, of what? So we say, for instance, we take x1 minus, no, 
e1 x0 minus e0 x1 e2 x0 minus uh, e0 x2 and so on a n x0 minus uh, a0 xn. So if I'm not mistaken, you find that this precisely will determine uh, this equivalence class. I mean, <coughs> so precisely the statement that, uh, you know, that up to multiplying by a non-zero constant, uh, the coordinates have to be these. Anyway, you can check that. So now we want to come to the story with the ideals. I want to So if we have a polynomial, we can always write it as a sum of homogeneous polynomials. So the polynomial f in k x0 to xn can be written uniquely as um, f equal to, say, f0 plus f1 plus, plus you know, whatever fd, where d is uh, the degree of the polynomial, where the fi homogeneous of degree i. We just take all the monomials of degree i together with their coefficients, and we take the sum of those and uh, put them together. So these, these fi are called uh, homogeneous components. Of f. Now, an ideal is called homogeneous if with every polynomial it contains all its homogeneous polynomial all its homogeneous components so an idea i is called homogeneous so homogeneous ideal if for every f in i, also all homogeneous components f i are in i. Okay, so this is slightly strange definition, but there's a, you can formulate it in the other way, namely have the following proposition, so more remark, an ideal is homogeneous if it's generated by homogeneous polynomials. and only if it is generated by homogeneous polynomials. if and only if there is a set of generators so that all the generators are homogeneous. Well, I don't know whether... Uh, 
Yeah, I can also prove it, although it's not very exciting, but uh, <coughs> at least you see it. So, proof. So we assume we assume that I is homogeneous. And so we take some system of generators Well, so then for each of the generators, we can take the homogeneous, the homogeneous components. If we take all the homogeneous components of all the generators, they will certainly generate because we can write the generators as a combination of them. So then the F alpha i, all alpha and ri are a set of homogeneous generators. Because after all, F alpha is the sum of the F alpha i. And so whatever you can express in terms of the F alpha, you can uh, do in terms of the F alpha i. And the other direction is ever so slightly more complicated. So let i be generated by homogeneous polynomials. So gi. generated by G, G I, I, where these are, the G I are homogeneous. Okay, so I have to show that for every F in I, I can write it as a, uh, we have that all the homogeneous components of F lie also in I. So we take an F in I, So then thus we can write F is equal sum over I, a finite sum uh, AI GI, because after all the GI are generators with AI some elements in K, X0 to Xn, not necessarily homogeneous. And now, but notice, but GI is homogeneous. Um, so, no, so the homogeneous part of a certain degree of this product is just, you know, this. GI multiplied by the corresponding homogeneous part of AI. So thus, the homogeneous part of AI GI of degree D is just um, GI times the homogeneous part of degree, sorry, I, the homogeneous part of degree um, D minus the degree of GI. No? You, know, you get something of degree. D by uh, getting taking here something of degree D minus the degree of this. So that's the way how you get the polynomials. It's just the, the sum of all the monomials of AI which have the, the degree such that it adds up to D. Well, but if that is so, then we know how to get the homogeneous part of degree D of F. We just take this part. So thus it follows that FD is the sum of all i of ai 
to the d minus the degree of gi. So the part, homogeneous part of degree d minus gi times gi. Okay, and so uh, the gi, so it, it is a linear combination of the generators, so it follows that this thing is indeed an element in I. Okay. Okay, so I'm sending up, but I can at least write down the definition we were aiming for. And we will come back to that the next time. So, so we want to say what the zero set of an ideal is. So according to our, uh, and we want to say this for homogeneous ideal, but we cannot say it's the zero set of all the elements in the ideal because we have only talked about zero sets of homogeneous polynomials. So we only talk, it's the zero set of all the homogeneous elements in the ideal. So definition. At i in k x zero to x n be an ideal. So <coughs> the so in some sense projective, but we will not write it zero set of i is. Uh, is uh, denoted again z of i, which is the set of all points p in pn, such that f of p is equal to zero for all homogeneous elements. Uh, do I want an ideal or I want the homogeneous? Yeah. Yeah, I want the homogeneous ideal. For all homogeneous elements F in I. So the zero set of I is not the zero set of all, the common zero sets of all elements in I, but only of the homogeneous ones, because we have only said what it means to be zero for homogeneous polynomial. And uh, conversely, we can talk about the ideal of, uh, uh, of an, uh, a projective algebraic set. This is just the ideal which is generated by all homogeneous polynomials which vanish on that set. Or just, um, so for a subset, um, X in Pn, uh, the homogeneous, but again, we will not really say it. Ideal of X is uh, I of X, which is defined to be the set of all F in K X0 to Xn, such that F is homogeneous. And f vanishes on the whole of x. So f of p is equal to 0 for all p in x. And by definition, this is a homogeneous ideal. Now, next time we'll 
work a little bit with it. <coughs> so we, we have seen, we have kind of uh, made the same, I mean, the analogous definitions to the affine case. We want to then prove that most of the results uh, we proved in the affine case also hold in, in a suitable way in the projective case. And then, uh, okay, that we will do the next time. So thank you and uh, see you next week. <laughs>